Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, open your Bibles to James chapter 2. James chapter 2. Starting verse 14, he said, What does it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? Can faith save him? Okay, if a brother or sister be destitute, or excuse me, be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, ye warm them filled, notwithstanding you give them not those things which are needful to the body, what does it profit? Okay, even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. A yea, man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, or outside of thy works, and then I will show thee my faith uh, by my works. Okay, thou believest there is one God, thou, believe, uh, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. Uh, but wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? And then 21. Uh, Was not Abraham our father justified by works? when he had offered Isaac, his son, upon the altar. And seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works um, was faith made perfect? And scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Okay, ye see then how that by works a man is justified, and not by faith alone. Okay, likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works, when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Okay, so. <laughs> uh, we're going to be dealing, well, we're, we're going to be looking at Mormonism, which they take this passage in particular. Uh, they have other things that they count on outside of Scripture, but as far as Scripture, this is one of the main passages that they use to go ahead and justify their belief system. And so, uh, fundamentally, we're just going to look at, okay, what is it that James is trying to communicate to us, since it seems that he's saying, basically, in other words, you have to work for salvation, in a sense. It's not what he's saying, but that's just cursory. Uh, just by appearance, it seems like, okay, wow, wait a minute. <laughs> this, I know for me, this was a confusing passage when I was first saved. Uh, I'm not sure if any of you all had that kind of issue or not, but like I know for me, it, it seemed, it, it was, I was like, why did I come across this? Um, I don't know that you'd want to value his opinion, but I know uh, Martin Luther uh, in particular <laughs> thought that this portion of Scripture shouldn't even be in Scripture. Uh, initially, at following following his salvation. Okay, so... What is dead here? Dead? It's the same as Thanatos. It's just uh, being separated. Like, in other words, you... Uh, a dead body is... So the faith died because it doesn't have work? No, it, it, you don't have... You're powerless, you're ineffective, you don't, you don't have... Uh, a, what, same as a dead body, the body doesn't have power or en you know, energizing life to be able to go ahead and move or to function. So it, your, your, uh, your faith doesn't have... It's not active. I was actually, I was, so Larry Barry was here, and we actually met with a Catholic monk, and he had a rather extensive argument with this, uh, this passage. Mm -hmm. so he did. Oh no, you are saying that See, right here, James chapter 2. I'm sure there's others that do, that go to this passage, I know. In particular with the Mormons, they do uh, this one. And then, <clears throat> they, well, okay, so, Let's establish context. James is speaking here to brethren, and then he's already addressed them concerning the fact that they need to have patience. Uh, they need to be asking God for wisdom with regard to the trials when they don't know how to handle that. And then he also dealt with them at the beginning of the chapter as far as respect of persons, that they are not to have respect of persons. So 
No, mind you, he's already addressing people that are that are born again, that are believers. He's he's addressed them already as brethren. Uh, I believe yes. that real faith will always produce works, but it's it's the faith that saves you. It's and the works are are the fruit of that salvation. Uh, in Romans, I'm sorry, in uh, Ephesians two ten, it says uh, that the grace are you saved by faith. That then it says. Uh, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto the works which God yeah. before ordained that we should walk in them. And here, make, uh, Moses, the only, you know, if you, you say you believe something and you don't take any action in it, it means you don't really believe it. Moses, I mean, sorry, Abraham believed God and he offered his son Isaac. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was a sign of his faith. We sing that song by Fanny Crosby, Trust and Obey, for there's no other way to show to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. But there's no other way to show your faith than to, than to be of no obedience. With I think that's what James was saying. I don't think he's saying you're saved by works. I'll just cut to the chase. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. Instead, instead of leading through the argument, okay, I'll just cut to the chase since it's, it's easier for me to do it like that. Um, He's addressing as far as our standing before men, in other words, when we are viewed by men. Uh, does God know our hearts? Yes or no? I mean, I know, I'm not trying to yes. insult anybody in intelligence, okay? So obviously he knows whether or not you choose right, whether or not you choose wrong. He, ultimately, really, really, the only people that know whether you're saved or not is he and you, okay? Uh, and even then, we're told in Peter that if you are living for God, you can even forget that you were purged of your old sins. Okay, so it's possible for you to even get in a state of confusion to the, to the reality that, okay, God has cleansed you. Um, but really, God knows your heart, and you know whether or not you've trusted and you've uh, received him as Savior. But as with regard to our standing before men, um, our righteousness is viewed on the basis of our works. Now, um, he brings up a good point here. He says, what does the prophet of a man say? He hath faith and have not works. Can that faith save him? And then he, the illustration used, good morning. The uh, illustration used is that if you have a brother or sister uh, be naked and destitute of daily food, and then one of you saying to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, and then they don't give them what they need. We're in uh, James chapter 2. James chapter 2. And then we're like verses 14 to the end of the chapter, which is 26. So James chapter 2, verse 14 through 26. Yes, ma'am. So his illustration there, you come up to somebody that they don't have clothing or they don't have food, they have need of something. And then you come up, God bless you, brother. And then you don't provide for them, right? You don't help them out. What, you know, how did that benefit them? According to James' illustration, it didn't really benefit them anything. So in other words, it's, you know, it wasn't any good. So the same way in, in that, okay, you say you believe something, but if there's no action to follow, then it's like, okay, well, you don't, you know, according to God's standard, you don't really believe that. Now, there's the essence of Christian living, and then you have, which is sanctification, and then you have salvation, okay, which are two distinct separate things. Um, what does God say that we are to do with regard to salvation? What's God's work for us to perform with regard to salvation? Believe so what would be the proof of that? In other words, if you have an act, if you have a command, if you have a command from God regarding anything, there's supposed to be an action that follows that, that kind of demonstrates whether or not you're actively obedient. Yes. If I'm a burnt in a burning building and the fireman's down there with a net and he says jump, the only way I can show my faith is to jump. Okay. I think there has to be some kind of an action where you, you put your trust in Jesus Christ, not just know it in your head. 
go to uh, John chapter 6. John chapter 6. Uh, verse 27, we're going to skip down because it, you'd have to read the bulk, uh, bulk of the chapter to be able to get the context, but uh, chapter, uh, verse 27 in chapter 6 of John. Okay, so labor not for the meat which perishes, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. Uh, for him hath God the Father sealed. And they said unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Okay, Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. Okay, and then said, uh, therefore, they said therefore unto him, What sign showest thou then that we may see and believe, and what dost thou work? Well, okay, our fathers did eat man in the desert, and it is written, he, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Um, well, we'll stop there just to kind of, all right, so this is following the feeding of the 5,000 that Jesus had separated himself. This is a following day. Uh, he had already fed a group of, well, I would suspect it would be over 5,000, really, because you had not just men that were counted, but you had uh, women and children that would be in the crowd there, um, quite possibly multiple children uh, per family. Out of uh, five loaves and two fishes, uh, they were fed. And plus they had leftover. You had enough for the apostles themselves, and then uh, you know, still baskets that were left over. They had just been miraculously fed by God uh, the day following. And then he, when they go to seek him out, they see, okay, he's not where we thought he was. So they cross over, and then they actually find him, and then this is where he starts addressing them. And then his comment to them was that, you don't seek me because you want to follow me or worship me. You seek me because your bellies were filled with the bread that I gave you all. And then, you know, and that, that's when he starts into, he says, you know, labor not for the food that perishes, but for that which is, you know, that leads you to eternal life. And so then they come back with this, you know, hey, um, you know, what do you do? What kind of miraculous work? You know, Jews seek a sign. So what is it, what do you show us as a sign to show us that you really are Messiah? Well, it's kind of stupid. Didn't they just get fed the day before, literally? <laughs> Miraculously, out of five loaves, two fishes? Beyond just the other things that uh, it's already been repeated, the fact that he had, you know, caused the blind to see, uh, he's caused the deaf to hear, uh, the lame to walk, uh, he's healed many sicknesses and diseases as he went through and passed by in the villages, he's healed lepers. Uh, so he, you know, he hasn't raised Lazarus at this point, um, but he had uh, raised a centurion's daughter that was ill. And you have a number of other different miracles that he has already performed. The, um, I know this doesn't seem like something that would be a little like earth-shattering significant, but even the turning the water into wine at the at marriage of Cana. So he's already demonstrated, and he already had had a number of individuals that come to believe on him. And so they approach him, and they're like, hey, you know, in other words, their focus isn't on that which is eternal, but, you know, on the temporal. And then they tell him, hey, you know, what, what work do you do? You know, for, well, first off, what's the work that God wants us to do? And then here's his answer to them. He says that you believe on him who he had sent. Okay, so God's work for eternal life is just believing on Christ. So how is that demonstrated? How do you demonstrate belief? Romans 10, 9, you call on him. In other words, you would have... Go to Romans 10, 9. They would, they would have... They would have come to him. In other words, they would have cried out to him. They would have asked, God, save me because of what Jesus is going to do. Or Jesus, save me. In other words, uh, 
Romans 10, 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. If for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And then, you know, uh, verse 13, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Here's a distinctive, okay? It's not just an acknowledging of historical facts, okay? Yeah, Jesus was alive uh, and those kinds of things, but rather it's 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 you committing, you know, keeping of your soul to God that, hey, Jesus is Almighty God. Jesus is Jehovah. And then, Lord, what you're offering, the gift, which that he died to pay for my sin, but he didn't stay that he rose again from the dead three days later to give me new life so that, Lord, I, I want that gift. And so I entrust my, I entrust my soul to him. So rather than me doing something because I can't do anything to be able to please him. So what would that look like then? I would have called on him. Now what does that look like as far as demonstrated in an action? It's my belief system as to whether or not Jesus is really God. You know, so in other words, <laughs> there's, there's everything that would follow from that as far as commands or that demands obedience to God is a matter of sanctification. That's me being transformed to be more like Christ. Because God's purpose, we're told uh, later on in the book of Romans, is that, uh, or excuse me, earlier on in the book of Romans, is that we're, we're, uh, we're predestined to be conformed to the image of, of Christ. So Jesus is the pattern, and we're supposed to be like him. So everything about us, uh, regardless of how we were raised, whatever our background is, as far as that doesn't, line up with what Christ is like needs to come off. And then God, the Holy Spirit, does that. And it's as we yield ourselves, as we are obedient uh, to his leading uh, and his moving in our life, that that's evidenced. Okay? But as far as with regard to salvation, God's very clear. He said his work was uh, you believe on him whom he had sent. In other words, that you believe on Christ. And that's demonstrated by whether or not the person actually cried out or called out on God to save them. And then their belief system as to whether or not Jesus is God, according to Romans 10. Um, so I'm sorry, go back to James. Then. So back to James chapter 2. James' argument here, okay, what does it profit, my brethren, does a man, if a, though a man say he hath faith and have not works, can faith save him? Can that faith save him? In other words, if you have a belief system that's empty, no. Now, by the way, is this talking about salvation from going to hell or salvation from something else? What's that? The verse starts out asking if it's profitable. What doesn't profit? Is this a profitable thing? Yeah, it, it's not profitable. It's not profitable if if you say you believe something, but there's nothing to follow. And then he goes on and he gives the illustration, okay, if a brother or sister be destitute destitute of food or they're naked and then you tell them depart in peace be warm and filled you don't give them the things that uh, that are needed for the body then it doesn't profit anything okay and even so faith if it does not if it hath not worked I'm sorry so what is the answer to that question verse 14 can faith save them? can that faith an empty faith no in other words okay but is it saving him from what, though? Is it saving him from going to hell or saving him from... Okay, if he... You're saved by crying out to God, Lord, save me. And then you tr you're trusting him. That's as far as eternal, you know, being, escaping hell. You cry out to God. I believe Jesus is Almighty God. 
and I'm crying out to him to rescue me from going to hell because I can't do anything. Yes? Uh, it's, it's the trusting that, that God's going to do it. Because if you have a whole bunch of kids that come up um, and they want to get saved, it doesn't mean they're really getting saved. They can just say whatever you say. It doesn't mean they got saved. My brother was like that. He got he was supposed to be saved when he's like three or four. But I got saved about four. And it just depends it's the trusting, the belief that it's gonna really happen. You're trusting God. See I was I was told if you if you would go and said that um, if you trust that Santa Claus is going to get you to heaven, um, he'll, he'll come up and, and ask Santa Claus to get you to heaven. He'll give you a lot more presents this year. A lot of kids walk up. So it, it's the trusting in, in God that makes the difference. It's not what you say. Yeah, it is, it's, yeah it's your heart towards God. In other words, you got to, yes? Uh, in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says, If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Sure. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. We can never know whether a person is really saved, but we can have a pretty good idea when we see fruit in their life. We yes. see a change. And if somebody's really saved, you can expect to see a change. Yeah. The, I'm sorry, go ahead. Right, but this isn't necessarily talking about evaluating someone else for their salvation. It's like, what is necessary to salvation and it sounds like I'm hearing like there's a first work uh, like a one work of belief well belief's not a work okay. but in other words what the way Jesus defined it was basically if you're looking for a work to do there isn't anything in other words you believe on him well that work is to believe on him but if you yeah. if you're putting your trust completely in him it's a it's something you do in your heart not in your mind James says in this next same chapter, he says, Believe thou that there is one God, the devils also believe and tremble. Just knowing in your mind doesn't do anything for you. It has to be a decision in your heart to put your trust in Jesus Christ. Just just like I'm sitting in this chair and I trust the chair to hold me up. I have to it's, that's there's some, that action proves my faith. Yeah. And so with regard to so, salvation. But that's just saying it's not profitable. Mm -hmm. That it's not saying that's a requirement for Salvation. I would agree. The, the evidence of what you would see with regard to would be what do they believe about Christ? That's the only thing you could really evaluate. And even then, really, only that person knows and you know. Or they know and God knows. Right. But or you know and God knows. I mean, there's there's a intrinsic truth versus a, you know, what someone else can perceive from someone else. And I would say the intrinsic truth is... Can faith save them? Yes, faith can save. Or are you saying that you don't think this faith here is talking about the faith of salvation? There's, 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 there's a, yes, sorry. I think it's very important to remember uh, <clears throat> if the person has to get the Word of God, they have to hear or see uh, the Word of God. And uh, if we just give them what we think, you know, or what our opinion is. I, that's why it's really good to show a person in the Bible and let them read for themselves what God says. And God works uh, through His Word. And uh, then we can exercise faith. Romans 10 17. Yeah. It comes back where you hear it. James' argument here is that that faith can't. In other words, like, in other words, you, if you're not obedient to what's taught, then you don't. Can't what? Can't save or isn't profitable? Well, it's two questions. Because it's broken up. If you look at the, okay. Mm -hmm. If there's no works to follow, then it's not profitable. And then can faith save him would be understood as being you no know, can that faith alone without without a accompanying work. What I'm making a distinction about is that believing is not 
necessarily a work. It is an action mm -hmm. that we, in other words, you, you commit, you believe, right. but it's not regarded as a work. Right. That Jesus made that clear, in other words, because he he put he posited the argument that was asked of him. Well, what's the work that you know? What do we do to work the works of God? I said, well, the work that God would have you do is believe on Him when He had sent, or in other words, believe on Christ, believe on me, not me, but you know, it was Christ speaking to to the multitudes that were there. If if that's regarding salvation, regarding sanctification, would be obedience to any command. Now, the only um, as a new creature, somebody has the Holy Spirit inside of them, you're going to have new desires, you're going to have new direction, you're going to have new everything. It's only as a person yields that you're going to see any evidence. So if a person's stubborn and doesn't want to yield or is disobedient to, some, to whatever degree, you won't see that. Well, I think James was saying here, uh, from a practical point of view, if you say you're saved and you don't have any fruit, then you're... Uh, I'm going to treat you as if you're not saved, and I, I think we need to do that for a from a practical point of view. People in the church do, and they need to be exhorted, because uh, real faith is going to change you. Because you have the Holy Spirit into you. Yeah, it's only but it's only as a person yields that they so, will. Maybe he's trying to do that, but is he also trying to incite believers who aren't showing their works to? show their work, you know, this is something that should be part of a believer's life, I mean, he's talking here to believers, mm -hmm. and that too, his mm -hmm. illustration is, you know if you're just going to tell someone you know, be warm and filled you know, you, you have the food you know, you've, you've, you've been saved, but if you're not giving it out, then it, it's not profitable you know, what the, are the works the, is it giving people things? No, it, it could be anything as far as you're actually, if, well, we can go through most of the New Testament. We're, as far as we're saved on the good works, we're called to, to demonstrate good works. We're supposed to be mindful and careful to maintain good works, as in Titus. Give me an example of a good work. Um, Giving money to someone? Helping those that would be in need. Uh, you would have as well that... Um, it's sure. not just necessarily limited to money, though. Could I mean, you could give of your life or your faith, time. Having compassion, giving of your time, listening. Coming to church. Romans 10, 9. Making Anything God tells us to do is the sure. act of obedience and work. Make that confession of your of your, safe, of your salvation to someone else or to the church. It's, I think uh, that, that's most certainly one work that, that proves salvation. You, yeah, you're going to have the Holy Spirit in you that's going to be prompting you, directing you, and, and bringing conviction in your life. Um, only as a person is obedient, I guess, or yielded, yields to that, to that direction and the prompting and the leading of the Holy Spirit will you see. Um, some, with some people it's more dramatic, other people it's not quite as much. Uh, but the fact is, is that if a person, they'll have a in a sense, in an in in effective faith. Uh, We've got to be careful here. We don't get into John MacArthur's Lordship salvation. No, that's that's what I'm trying to make a distinction about. Yeah. There's an influence of Calvinism in Christian circles. Uh, I understand some of it might be knee-jerk, but you have. I think they're raining. That's why they're coming in. <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah. It. You have. Um, the P in the tulip, perseverance of the saints, which basically asserts that uh, if a person is really born again, that they would persevere to the end. In other words, that it really should be preservation. Yeah, but in other words, their Christian growth is automatic, seeing as how um, God is sovereign and they don't really have a free will to override. That's where that's the underlying mentality behind the P in the tulip. Okay, that assertion. Yeah. So that's why most people you would you would say okay, well, 
Christian growth is going to be automatic. If we don't see any fruit, then okay, you weren't really saved to begin with. Okay, that's false. And the thing is, is that a person is yielded to the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. um, what you see, and even to, to the degree that they are, uh, and quite often the person that. <laughs> Welcome. We're in James chapter two. I just heard uh, Joel say preservation rather than perseverance. I think that's a good, a good yeah. substitute word that. It makes that point of Calvinism true. Yeah, but they they it's it's that underlying teaching that really kind of you you find a lot where people want to argue. Okay, as far as okay, well there's there's no works that they weren't really you know you know, what's the proof? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> when we're saved, we put our faith in Christ. When we're uh, our works shows our faith to the world, to the lost. Yes. So that's why it's important. Yeah. And that, that's an issue of sanctification, yeah. So it does. Because the thing is, they won't have. Um, we have, it's kind of, <laughs> it seems like an overwhelming thing, honestly, because the fact is, you have Christ now that you're representing, and then, uh, you know, King of King, Lord of Lords. And depending on, you know, how you were raised, you might have been, you know, well, we were all child, children of the devil before we got saved, but somebody could have been totally wild, and then that's everything, everything now that's Christian life is completely foreign and new. You know, like, wow, it's, <laughs> this is a lot to have to deal with, and then even then, you, it's like, okay, you don't want to be misrepresenting him. Uh, so I can see where that would be overwhelming. So James, okay, assertion here of Faith without works okay, is dealing primarily with, or in other words, our relationship with men as opposed to with God. I say that for this reason, okay. Obviously, we know, okay, God knows our hearts, correct? All right, so he would know whether or not uh, we believed or not. Uh, what, why would it be necessary for me to like prove to him? It's not. It's not proof. Yeah. In other words, I'm, am, I, am, I, am I seeking? Okay, God, here, let me prove to you. I really believed. No. No. <laughs> no. He knows. He knows. Beginning from the end, he knows my heart. It was like, and it wasn't part of. It wasn't what you did that saved you. So. Yeah. You know. It's a, yeah. I'm sorry. Yes. It's uh, so that people could see that you're really saved, not just. Uh, say what you said. Right, but he was asking, do we need to prove it to God? Yeah, no, yeah, okay, in other words, yeah, we wouldn't have to prove it to God. I mean, you, you'd have to prove it to people, and even then, really, really, you know and God knows. And then as you are seeking to be obedient to him, and then you're accurately representing him, and then he's able to flow through you to work in other people's lives. Um, okay. Uh, Revelation 3.2, he's talking to the church of Sardis. He said, Be watchful and strengthen the things which are ready, that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. I think that's kind of maybe uh, describes the kind of faith that he's talking about, a dead faith. He's not saying they're not saved, he just saying your faith is dead. It's not we're not doing anything. It's a, yeah, it's ineffective. Yeah. It doesn't work. In other words, it doesn't, you're not gonna, you'd be a lot in a sense. Uh, that's, to me, the clearest example. We're told uh, in Second Peter, you know, that righteous man backs his soul daily uh, among the conversation of the wicked. Uh, I'll be honest with you, I wouldn't have thought he would have been a born again man. <laughs> if you just read through Genesis, as far as his life, I mean, I know he, he was Abraham's nephew and then he accompanied with him and then, you know, he parted ways with him and went over to Sodom. And then following what happened in Sodom, all the account that we have of that, I wouldn't, I would, honestly wouldn't have thought he would have been somebody who would have been born again. Uh, his own kids, uh, with the exception of his two daughters that actually escaped, uh, mocked him. So, you know, he lost his family. Uh, and then even the two kids that 
left with him, uh, you know, committed immorality with him. And, you know, you have Israel now fighting with the consequences with regard to what happened there. And God calls him a righteous man. Yeah. He's actually born again. We're going to see him in heaven. Yeah. I, would, I, would I would never have thought that. And there's other individuals that are similar to that with regard to their character and how they carry, how they carry themselves. That in standing before God, uh, or they're standing before God, they're righteous because they believed on him, but they did, uh, they did nothing with regard to living out their, their faith in Christ. They didn't obey prompting the Holy Spirit. They didn't obey God's commands. And they had a, a wasted life. I didn't even get to. Even to <laughs> Does anybody have any questions? I didn't even get to anything. Was, yeah. <laughs> I, the only reason I touched this was because this is the main passage that uh, I haven't had a whole lot of interaction with Mormons. I've had more with Jehovah's Witnesses, but the few ones that I have had, it's always coming back to this that theirs is a works based faith system. Uh, they're very similar in, in nature to what would be the Muslims, the Islam, with regard to how they came about to be, and then also uh, their their teachings. They have uh, polygamy, and beyond that, they believe Jesus is God, but not quite like how we would believe He's God. He's not just okay, Creator God. He's a created being, God. Uh, so he's like a God, uh, but we ourselves can attain God status if we work, and then our works are found to be favorable. Uh, and also beyond that, they uh, don't hold the Bible as being complete authority. Uh, they add to it with, they have uh, three other books. Uh, you have Pearl of Great Price, Doctrine and Covenants, and then the Book of Mormon that are an additional revelation to uh, the Word of God. That are, Actually, they hold more authority in practice than what the Word of God, even though they would tell you, oh, no, you know, we believe uh, King James Bible, and then we believe the Word of God holds you know, great authority. But the fact is that they get most of their teaching from uh, Doctrine and Covenants and from Book of Mormon. So that holds in practice, greater authority than what the Word of God would. And then they have this whole false narrative that you had an Israelite tribe come from Israel to the Americas, basically to North America and South America. Uh, we're told in the book of John that, uh, John chapter 10 in particular, Jesus said that other sheep have I, um, that you know, not a, in other words, that there's not just a tribe of Israel that, and so they take that to mean that okay, God had sent uh, this lost tribe basically from Israel to come down to the Americas, and then they have a whole. It's all fictitious, but because there's no actual archaeological proof to the fact that anything Middle Eastern was here in the Americas during the time period whenever uh, he received his revelation, basically in the same manner that. Uh, with the exception that he wasn't illiterate and he wasn't an epileptic, but he did fall himself under some kind of demonic trance where he was uh, basically possessed by demons. He said he found these two stone, not stone tablets, these two tablets that um, he had found God's revelation to him. And then from that he translated uh, the Book of Mormon and then he goes off basically kill and swindle and um, be as corrupt an individual as anyone can be in his western expansion. He never got further than Missouri because he was killed off in Missouri. Right. Does anybody have any questions? Right. Um, if not, we're dismissed.